we search the mysteries of UFOs, an area that is often overlooked is that of UFOs entering and emerging from water. Often tagged USOs, these objects have the capability of maneuvering in, through, and out of the water into open spaces. The proper term for this phenomena is unidentified submersible objects. To really investigate this subject, we must separate UFOs seen flying over a lake or near lakes and oceans with those which have been reported to enter or emerge from water. This is not to say that a UFO reported over water cannot navigate lakes and oceans, but there may be special properties to those which have reportedly entered or exited the lakes and seas of our world. Another fact that we should consider is that although the Earth's surface is approximately 75% water, these areas are not nearly as closely monitored as our lands, which of course contain the vast majority of our populations. It's very possible, even probable, that UFOs navigating our oceans and lakes are very rarely witnessed by human eyes. There have been many reports of UFOs over water, and a much smaller amount of reports of UFOs navigating our lakes and oceans. The question must be asked, why do UFOs enter our waters? This question can only be answered with several other questions. Do alien beings have a personal need of water? Do alien craft have a use for water? Do aliens have underground bases in our oceans? From the preponderance of reports, all three of these questions can be answered with a big yes. There have been multiple reports of aliens asking for water for either themselves or for their craft, and reports of UFOs staying underwater for several days without emerging must indicate that they have somewhere to anchor their craft beneath the surface or have bases under the sea. These theories bring us to the gist of this article, where we shall bring to light some of the most notable, best documented cases of these UFO underwater events. There are many cases of unidentified submerged objects or UFOs, but nothing like the amount of UFOs which are seen in our skies. What we've learned over the years is that UFOs are on many occasions hypervasive. They seem to have the capabilities of being extremely stealthy and radar undetectable, as well as being able to possibly cloak themselves from sight and seemingly only be visible within the infrared spectrum. It's even speculated that such craft can disguise themselves as possibly morph into other things, take on a different appearance or something less sinister. This, of course, could be down to how the phenomenon manipulates the human perception. Therefore, it's understandable that UFOs may hide themselves from sight by utilising our lakes, our seas and our oceans. In 1947, about 20 miles south of Malta, fishermen were at work raising and lowering their nets in the hope of a big catch. Suddenly, they saw an unusual object not too far from their boat. Frightened by the strange object, the fishermen quickly yanked their nets from the sea, fired up their boat and put some distance between themselves and the unknown craft. Suddenly, a bright light lit up the area around the craft. Small beings could be seen running across the deck of the object. Visible to the fishermen was some type of apparatus around the waist of the beings. Later, after initial reports of the incident were revealed, one of the witnesses claimed that the beings were about the size of a 10-year-old boy. He could see them enter the craft, which soon submerged, never to be seen again. In a report released through the History Channel, in 1960, the Argentinian Navy encountered two unknown submerged objects in the New Gulf, or Golfo Nuevo. This event occurred about 650 miles south of Buenos Aires, Argentina. It was initially thought that the objects were submarines, but this theory was soon dismissed as the object appeared to break into smaller pieces and fly out of the ocean. According to reports by Philip Mantle, these pieces disappeared as they left the water. Of course, skeptics believe that all that was seen were submarines firing torpedoes, but it was revealed that in 1960, the firing of six or more torpedoes at one time was not possible. A much talked about case 
that's re-emerged is the Pascagoula incident that took place many years ago. But it, with the new release of a book and information that's come out regarding new witnesses that, that saw this object at the time, when you start to dig deep into that case, you'll find that it all started with a UFO that seemingly came out of the water and then interacted with a number of individuals, two in fact, which had missing time, which went on to report it to the police and become the Pascagoula incident that we know today. There are incidents where people have reported missing time in association to these objects rising from the ocean, rising from the lakes. Um, there is also the Allagash abduction case where canoers were actually, had missing time again of this object which was over the lake. You know, there seems to be a connection between the UFO phenomena and these vast bodies of water. There's even reports that some UFOs even seemingly seem to suck up water. Uh, are they utilising it in some way? We don't have all the answers, but there is plenty of photographic and video evidence out there of a connection between the phenomena and these bodies of water around the planet. We just don't know what that connection is. Are they hiding in plain sight beneath our waters? Have they been here for a long, long time? Or did they neither, never leave? We have all these questions and not enough answers. One thing is for sure, that sightings of UFOs, sightings of unidentified submerged objects, continue to get reported year in and year out. In 1966, the USS Tiru left Pearl Harbor bound for Seattle, Washington, during the Rose Festival. The submarine was set at a pier near downtown Seattle and toured by thousands of curious individuals. Unknown at this time was that the sub's trip to Seattle had been far from routine. While cruising on the water's surface one late afternoon, the port lookout reported a strange object at a range of two miles, bearing 315 degrees relative. The port lookout referred his contact to the starboard and OOD, Object Orientated Design Lookouts. The three lookouts, using binoculars, were shocked to see a metallic craft larger than a football field, drop from the clouds into the ocean. It was reported to tumble end over end, hit the water and disappear among the water geysers and ocean. When starboard and OOD lookouts confirmed what they had seen, the port lookout related that initially he had seen the object go from the water up into the clouds. All three lookouts would soon see the object leave the ocean and join the clouds. During the same time period, Radar reported a contact at the same range and bearing. Sonar was picking up strange echoes. The captain was called to the bridge. The captain, along with the chief quartermaster, arrived within minutes. Almost immediately, the unknown object fell from the clouds into the ocean once again. Soon, however, the tea room moved out of visual contact with the object. The captain issued an order to all present. Never discuss what they had seen under any circumstances. The captain went below and sent a radio message. The witnesses had seen a metallic craft decked out with machined parts. There appeared to be windows around its circumference. No noise was heard. The object was shaped like a saucer with a bowl inverted in the saucer and it was huge. In 2015, a number of interesting UFO photographs were released. These black and white images were supposedly taken from the USS Tempang SSN 674 submarine in March of 1971. The images first appeared in a French paranormal magazine called Top Secret, I believe. And it was claimed that the photographs were taken whilst the submarine was traveling between Iceland and Norway, the Jamaican Islands in the Atlantic Ocean and under the command of Admiral Dean Reynolds. Now, according to US, uh, the US Navy archive, the USS Tempang was in fact in that area at that time. And Admiral Dean Reynolds was its actual commander. What's interesting is about these particular photographs is that they were taken in, close, in very close proximity to this object. Some of the images clearly show a huge object entering and leaving the ocean. No satisfactory explanation has ever come forward to explain these photographs. They remain a complete mystery. 
Should they represent a real UFO or USO? Then they could be the best photographic evidence ever to surface to the public domain. One of the most well-known UFO cases is that of the Shag Harbor crash of 1967. Although it's most difficult to determine if the UFO navigated into the water purposely or crashed into the water. However, if later eyewitness testimony can be believed, a second craft entered the waters to aid the first craft. It had been reported that the US Navy monitored the objects for quite some time. This would certainly indicate that the first object, possibly in trouble, had used the waters to avoid detection, awaiting aid from the second ship. In 1968, a Panamax, a bulk carrier, the Grishuna, under the Swiss flag, was off the coast of Florida. It was loaded with coal and en route to Japan. The reporter of this incident was a second officer who was on night watch from 0100 hours to 0400 hours. The Grishuna was in good weather and cruising at about 15 knots when our witness, who was watching the lights of Palm Beach, saw lights under the water surface. The lights were about 10 to 15 meters deep and 30 to 40 meters distant. He could make out an object which looked like a plane without wings or tail. He could also see windows from which light glowed. He thought there were 10 to 12 windows. The USO was crossing the path of the Grishuna and moving about twice her speed, and it was soon under the ship's bow. The second officer estimated the length of the object at 9 meters. Another seaman on the bridge admitted to seeing something under the water but was not sure what it was. The second officer was experienced with many years at sea. He'd seen about everything there was to see on the ocean, but this time he was baffled. His testimony is definite proof of the existence of USOs. It has often been said that we know more about the surface of our moon than we do the deepest seas and oceans. Absolutely agree. For years, strange phenomena has been reported by people at sea, especially Navy personnel. Many reports lie in the USO files of the Soviet and Russian Navy and remain secret. However, some of them do filter out on occasion. In their new book, authors Paul Stonehill and Philip Mantle reveal stories of strange encounters by the Soviet and Russian Navy of unexplained objects. The authors say most of these stories have never been told outside of Russia and provide yet more evidence that we are not alone. Indeed, they suggest a permanent presence of something unusual in the depths of Earth's largest bodies of water. The book is about the most current and on the subject of UFOs or unidentified submerged objects around. The book is about the most current on the subject of USOs, entitled Russia's USO Secrets. Another case of UFOs entering the water is that of the Buff Ledge encounter. In 1968, Buff Ledge, a girls' summer camp in Virginia, would be visited by four UFOs, which maneuvered in and out of the waters of Lake Champlain. Michael Lapp, a 16-year-old maintenance man, and 19-year-old water ski instructor Janet Cornell were relaxing on a boat dock on a quiet afternoon, as most of the camp inhabitants were away at a swim meet. Late afternoon, they were surprised to see a bright light approaching the lake, the object appeared to be a large disc. Soon, three smaller objects fell from the larger craft. These three craft began to move over the lake, appearing to put on an air show. Soon, the mothership descended into the water, emerged, and came right at the two friends. The object was so close that two small beings could be seen through a dome-like transparent top. The next thing the two friends knew, they were waking up still staring at the object now in the distance. Michael was trying to get his bearings. He checked on Janet, who seemed to be in a trance. Soon, they heard the welcome sound of the swim team returning to camp. The mothership moved from view, disappearing into the sky. It would be 10 more years before Michael, plagued by disturbing dreams of being abducted, would call upon the services of the Center for UFO Studies. Investigator Walter Webb took the case and suggested regressive hypnosis. This procedure brought out the details of an alien abduction. Likewise, Janet would also find that she had been abducted and subjected to medical tests. 
Webb would also find other witnesses from the camp that saw strange lights over Lake Champlain the same night of the abductions. Some people have asked about the Baltic Sea anomaly. Um, is it some type of ancient UFO? Well, the team investigating that so-called Baltic Sea anomaly, a bizarre underwater object measuring, I believe, about hundreds of feet in, in diameter, um, is speculated, to, or was initially speculated to be a UFO. But the evidence points to it being something else, maybe some type of ancient structure, and certainly particularly un unusual shaped and designed, is another ancient mystery that we just do not know. Um, but initially it was thought to be some type of large UFO sat on the bottom of the ocean. Uh, however, just because we found another explanation doesn't mean that it's less mysterious. A rare photograph is taken of a gigantic UFO by Lake Cote by a government mapping program in 1971. The photograph clearly shows details of the terrain below and a silver disc-shaped object which appears to be entering the water. American expert analysis deems the photograph authentic and because the plane was flying at a fixed altitude of 10,000 feet, it can be estimated that the UFO was over 600 feet in diameter. See more details of this case at UFO Photograph, Costa Rica, 1971. I do recall this particular photograph. It was certainly impressive. It was a Costa Rican National Geographic Institute. It was taking aerial photographs of a location where they captured what looked to be a huge rising object coming out of a lake. It was a twin engine Canadian F680, I believe, and they had a map making camera which was snapping photographs every 13 seconds. The photographer said that after the photographs were developed and the object that appeared in the one frame was discussed with his colleagues and he was forbidden of divulging any information at that time about the UFO. It wasn't until eight years later when the photograph actually surfaced, featuring in a newspaper in Costa Rica. After it being eventually released, UFO researchers soon picked up on the information. For two weeks, the Norwegian Navy tracked a USO in the Sonjafjord, the world's second longest fjord. The incident was taken so seriously by the government that ships and sub-seeking helicopters were called to find the object. On November the 20th, the UFO was seen exiting the water and described as a massive, silent, cigar-shaped object. One ship actually opened fire on what was considered a hostile craft, but to no avail, as the USO simply dived into the waters. The unknown object also avoided depth charges. Finally, it was decided to block up the fjord and trap the object, but somehow it slipped away. Between 4 and 5 p.m. on April the 17th, 1999, an unusual sighting was made by several witnesses who claimed to see a bright white light exiting the waters in Windermere, Invermere, British Columbia, at Lake Lookout. The weather was clear and sunny, with little to no wind. The waters were calm. One of the three witnesses made the following statement. Three of us were looking out into the water. It was a quiet, peaceful afternoon when we all noticed a bright white light emerging from the water. The object was breaking the water surface from the lake, yet wasn't leaving any ripples in the water, like a piece of wood or a log could. It showed itself as a sequence of digitized light, the kind that looks like the Knight Rider kit car has on the front. Instead, this computerized light was a bright white coloring. It appeared and disappeared, breaking the water surface three times before finally disappearing into the lake. This lasted for approximately five minutes. We had binoculars, so we were able to see the light close up, and to our amazement, it confirmed what we thought we'd seen. There's many reports of people seeing lights under the water, strange crafts that seem to be darting backwards and forwards, some of them seen rising from the surface and off, zipping off into the sky. There are many cases, there are at least, usually around about four or five reports a year that have come to my attention. Not so many in the UK, I mean we do have sightings in the UK, especially off the coast of, uh, of Bempton or Filey, uh, and we could say more the eastern side of the UK. And I've seen some very convincing footage of UFOs, triangular in shape, lifting from the ocean and flying off. And I have to say, it, it, it looked real to me. 
And if that is the case, then we really do have to start questioning, is this our technology? I assume for many years that triangular objects represented um, something we created, be it it's something that will fly through Earth's atmosphere, it's aerodynamic. Uh, and therefore, if it's triangular, it's got to be ours. Um, but I don't know. I mean, I'm, there is cases where I do question that and think to myself, do we have the technology of transmedium travel with be objects flying in space, the air and in water? Maybe, maybe we do have that technology. So if that is the case, then it's literally next to impossible to now, now work out what is them and what is ours. The National UFO Reporting Center has reported the sighting of a UFO over Vero Beach, Florida, that occurred on April the 14th, 2008. The witness claims that he observed two cigar-shaped, unidentified objects for about three minutes. The objects appeared to be playing as they flew in and out of the water and across the skies. The objects were first observed just above the horizon and at times could be seen entering the ocean. Incredibly, these objects would stop in midair, disappear, then reappear in a different place of the sky. The beach was almost vacant at the time and there were no other witnesses to the objects. The cases presented here are only a small portion of the many cases of reports of unknown flying objects maneuvering in and out of the waters of the world. There can be little doubt that the navigators of these objects are at home in our lakes and oceans. These craft possess capabilities that no earthly craft can duplicate, being able to go from underwater to flying in our skies with ease. This would indicate an advanced technology. Underwater UFO bases, do they exist, don't they exist? People are always asking those sort of questions. The, the problem is, is that there are speculations that such places do exist. I believe it's unlikely that we can't detect any of them, especially with today's incredible technology that we have. We have these underwater topo uh, topographic satellite mapping technology now, which we can do from space, and they can pick up many things underwater. However, there are some anomalies that still, we don't know what they are. One is such a, uh, is off the, six miles off the coast of Point Dumi in Malibu, in California. Uh, and there are some unusual structures there. We just don't know what they are on the seabed. Another is on the bottom of the Great Lakes in the US and the Santa Catalina Island, uh, or the channel, should we say, that is also a location where these strange things underwater seem to really exist. There are common reports throughout those areas of UFO sightings as well. So they kind of go hand in hand with these unusual things underwater. It could be quite unnerving to think that these have always been here or been here for a long time observing us uh, out of sight on the bottom of our oceans, places where we still don't seem seemingly have the technology to reach, not the deepest parts of our oceans anyway. Who knows what's down there? You know, anything could exist. And if that is the case, then how long have they been here? And what are they doing here? Um, reports come through all the time of these um, locations where these said anomalies are on the bottom of the ocean, which have been scanned by satellites from space and associated to the UFO sightings in that area. Maybe the United States Naval Services know more about what's really going on. After all, any researcher in the subjects of ufology will tell you that when you dig deep enough and start realizing what society, what organization, what establishment seems to be at the core of the UFO phenomena, it isn't the CIA, it's not the Department of Defense, it's not NASA, it's not the National Security Agency, it's Navy and the Naval Reconnaissance Office. They seem to know more about what's going on in the subject of UFOs and all, the, all these other defense agencies. Um, maybe that's a clue. Maybe it's just a, a, an indicator to say, yes, the UFOs are associated to the water and some people, some, know about this. When discussing strange locations and disappearances, many immediately think of the Bermuda Triangle. However, such mysterious areas of oceans, as well as seas and lakes, are much more common than what you might think. The Bermuda Triangle, a region of, say, three points, 
which is in the western part of North Atlantic Ocean, is defined by Bermuda, Florida and Puerto Rico. Has a long standing reputation for mysterious swallowings of boats, ships and even aeroplanes. The only sea without shores is the Sargasso Sea, which is a, re a region in the middle of the North Atlantic. And of course, that's also surrounded by very strange ocean currents. Several ships have been found drifting, completely without crew, through the peaceful waters. And in 1840, the French merchant ship, uh, the Rosalie, I believe it was called, sailed through the Sargasso Sea and was later discovered with its sails set but without any crew members on board whatsoever. The Michigan Triangle is also a location found in Michigan Lake, whose shoreline spans the states of Illinois and Michigan, Indiana, Wisconsin. It's located over the uh, central Lake Michigan area. The area has been blamed for mysterious disappearances of ships, crew members, and again, entire airplanes. One of the most notorious locations is, of course, the Devil's Sea also known as Pacific Bermuda Triangle. It's also a region of Pacific around the Mayaka Island, which is, I believe is about 60 miles off the south of Tokyo. This area is also known as the Dragon's Triangle because of its ancient legends about dragons that lived off the coast of Japan. There are tons of mysterious places around the world, both on land and in the water, that are difficult to explain logically. The legends of missing vessels and ghost ships drifting without its crew in these locations have made them synonymous with mystery. Though the notorious Bermuda Triangle tops the list of most mysterious places on this planet, a number of other locations also remain mysterious as much as the former. The Devil's Sea, also known as the Dragon's Triangle, is one of such sailors' nightmares in the waters around the world. Located near to the Japanese coast in the Pacific Ocean, the Devil's Sea, Mano Umi in Japanese, is one of the 12 vile vortices located around the Earth. Vile vortices are those areas where the pull of the planet's electromagnetic waves is stronger than anywhere else. As the title indicates, the Dragon's Triangle extends as a triangle between Japan and the islands of Bonin, including a major portion of the Philippine Sea. Geographically, the triangle is located around the Miyake, which is the Japanese island that lies around 100 kilometers south of Tokyo. However, the exact location of the Devil's Sea is disputed, since several reports claim different distances to the area. Some reports state that it's 110 kilometers far from Japan's east coast region, while another claims that it's located near Iwo Jima, a Japanese volcano island which is almost 1,200 kilometers from the Japanese coast. Since the Devil's Sea is not officially included on a map, the actual size and the perimeter of the notorious waters remains unknown. The area has also been called the Pacific Bermuda Triangle, denoting its position that is precisely opposite to the Bermuda Triangle and the similarities in the paranormal phenomena of the area a vile vortex is any of 12 purported particular graphic areas arranged in a pattern around Earth. The term was coined by Ivan T. Sanderson, I believe, who catalogued them as sites of unexplained disappearances and other mysterious phenomena. The idea has been taken up by other fringe writers who have argued that the vortices are linked to subtle matter energy, so like ley lines in a sense of speaking, or electromagnetic anomalies. These 12 vile vortices are said to exist in the Bermuda Triangle, uh, in the location of the Algerian megaliths in South, I think that's in Timbuktu, uh, the Zindus Valley in Pakistan, the uh, Hamakulia, I believe, volcano in, in Hawaii, the Wartan Basin in e Easter Island, east of Rio de Janeiro, the Loyalty Islands, the North Pole, and of course, the South Al uh, Atlantic Anomaly, and of course, Devil's Triangle. Such an infamous reputation for this oceanic area has not been gained recently, but has existed for decades and even centuries, if some records are to be believed. The area has been in the news for several decades for unexplained incidents of vanishing ships. According to the legends, the waters of the Triangle are notorious for making even the strongest vessels disappear, along with the crew aboard. It's said that the conqueror, Kublai Khan, 
the fifth great Khan of the Mongol Empire and the grandson of Genghis Khan, had tried to make inroads into Japan in 1274 and 1281 AD. However, on both attempts, he failed to invade the country after losing his vessels and 40,000 crew members in this triangular area, reportedly due to typhoons. As Kublai Khan and his army abandoned the plan to invade Japan, the Japanese believed that it's the god who sent the typhoons to save them from enemies. Later, strengthening the truth behind the legend, divers and marine archaeologists have found the remains of the Mongol fleets from the region. In the later century, especially in the 1940s and 50s, a number of fishing vessels and over five military vessels mysteriously disappeared whilst in the, the Dragon's Triangle. So, as a result, Japan sent a research ship named the Keomaru, Keomaru, I believe it was called, in 1952, to investigate the whereabouts of the missing vessels. However, just like the Martin Maria that went out to look for Flight 19 over Bermuda Triangle, the research vessel, with 31 crew members aboard, also met the very same fate. There are rumours of an undersea UFO base, and there have been encounters with UFOs and sightings of USOs. Even Soviet Navy ships pursued a USO in April of 1981. It was as classed as a cylinder-shaped object that was seen rising from the ocean. There have also been reports of UFOs and missing time on their clocks. On this particular incident, there was a UFO that came out of the sea and circled around one particular ship for about 15 minutes. And when it went back into the water, the captain and numerous other members of the crew reported their watchers were 15 minutes out, including the sensitive equipment on the ship and the ship's clocks. Missing time, you could say. Another story during the rounds tells of the sighting of a mysterious lady sailing a vessel in the Devil's Sea in the early 1800s. It's said that the vessel resembled the traditional Japanese equipment for burning incense. However, the destination and identity of the vessel still remain a mystery. In the later century, especially in the 1940s and 50s, a number of fishing vessels and over five military vessels have disappeared in the sea, in an area that lies between Mayaki Island and Iwo Jima. As a result, Japan sent a research ship named Kayumaru No. 5 in 1952 to investigate the previously missing vessels that had been reported to have gone missing in the Dragon's Triangle without any trace. However, the research vessels with 31 crew members aboard also met the destiny of previous vessels which went into the Devil's Sea. The wreck of the Kayumaro No. 5 was recovered later, but the whereabouts of the crew members were never heard of again. Following this incident, the Japanese government reportedly declared this area dangerous for ships and transporting goods. Moreover, as a result of this unprecedented incident, all efforts to unearth the facts behind the mystery were also aborted completely. To begin with, the term dragon in the Devil's Sea name originates from the Chinese fable about dragons existing below the surface of water. According to these fables, the dragons under the sea attack vessels passing by to satiate their hunger. These fables have originated well before the AD period, about 1000 BC. With their emphasis on the presence of mythical creatures like dragons, these fables have made a huge impact in the legends and mysterious stories created in the years to come. Similarly, the Japanese name, Mano Umi, means the Sea of the Devil. It was originally coined by the Japanese countrymen years ago when the stories of paranormal phenomena in the sea were popularized. The superstitions associated with the Devil's Sea always haunted the Japanese from venturing into this part of the ocean right from centuries past. As the myths of the Devil's Sea popularized through legends, there were also hypotheses, including scientific explanations, attempting to solve the mystery. Several efforts were also made to understand the truth behind the so-called paranormal phenomenon. Scholars like Ivan Sanderson have suggested that it's the hot and cold currents crossing this vile vortices leading to the disappearance of vessels in the Devil's Sea. According to him, these currents result in electromagnetic disturbances that trap the ships passing by. Another hypothesis suggested that it's the subsea volcanoes in the area that have caused the disappearance of vessels. The eruptions from these volcanoes could have initiated such accidents substantiating the stories of dragons sucking in ships and its crew to the ocean's depths. 
Due to the undersea volcanoes and seismic activity, according to marine scholars, the islands in the sea often disappear suddenly, while new ones appear at the same pace. More scientific research claimed that the anomalies believed to occur in the triangle were the result of an environmental phenomenon. Researchers argued that the area has the presence of methane hydrates on the seabed. When methane hydrates gas or methane clathrates explode, bubbles will be formed on the water surface as the ice-like deposits separate from the bottom of the ocean at the time of the explosion. These activities can interrupt buoyancy and also destroy a vessel without even leaving a trace. Some ships' disappearances um, have been speculated that they are down to natural forces. I mean, we have to take into consideration that the location of the Dragon's Triangle, there are numerous underground, or should we say underwater volcanoes, and sometimes they can erupt. You know, volcanoes release numerous different types of gases from the Earth, some of which may be even methane. Now, we do know when methane rises, uh, buoyancy is disturbed regarding ships. So what happens is a lot of this methane comes up and, and of course, explodes on the surface of the water. And the, the water suddenly loses its buoyancy and craft do actually just sink. Ships will just sink. They can't keep buoying any further. That might explain missing ships and missing people. Uh, natural phenomena that could account for some of these disappearances. But how does it affect planes and other things? It's a, still, I still believe there is maybe a bit of a mystery still there. However, in 1989, American writer and paranormal activity theorist Charles Berlitz wrote a book, The Dragon's Triangle after detailed research on the paranormal activities in the Devil's Sea. According to him, the accidents involved five Japanese military vessels in the Triangle were due to the evil nature of the sea and have resulted in the death of more than 700 million people. Later, questioning Charles' arguments that substantiating the Devil's Sea is a mythical area abound with paranormal activities, Larry Kusha published a book titled The Bermuda Triangle Mystery Solved in the year 1995. In his work, Kushka rejected the story of the disappearance of Japanese warships, arguing that the vessels that went missing were fishing boats. In his book, Kusha also claimed that the research ship sent by the Japanese contained a crew of only 31 people, as opposed to the 100 stated by Charles, and the vessel was wrecked instead of disappearing completely. He argued that the research vessel was wrecked by an undersea volcano in September 1952. The remains of the wreckage were retrieved by the Japanese a few years ago, which further rejected Charles's claims. The Pacific Bermuda Triangle might be subjected to numerous theories and suppositions, but in spite of the scientific evidence and the mythical aura surrounding the oceanic arena, its continued mysterious existence is a testimony that certain phenomena in the world are far beyond the control of human beings. What is interesting in these particular locations is that the Coast Guard have on many occasions come across ships, boats, yachts, and the crew are just missing. And they've never ever turned up. They're just a mystery. And they tow these boats and ships in uh, to the boatyard and, uh, and there's just no explanation where and what happened to these people. Some people have speculated that they were caught in a storm and washed off the boat. Um, but it doesn't look like that's the case on many of the, the situations. It seems to be that food has been laid out. Um, sometimes it looks like it's, they've only half eaten their dinner. And something obviously must have happened because these people are simply not on board. Um, it's also interesting to point out that there are a few cases where a lot of these larger boats, they've had um, pets on board, like uh, parrots, for an example. Um, but they have also not been in the cages. And the cages aren't open, they're still on the side, the, the door's shut, but there's nothing in there. Talking to relatives and friends said that, well, they, they do have a pet parrot and they take it with them and, and the parrot was missing. Sometimes dogs are found and they actually are on board. We don't know where their owners are, or where, you know, but they, sometimes dogs are left. So are we, are we looking at something quite odd here? I mean, is it that everything that could vocally say something is being taken? Such, you know, parrots do talk. Um, of course, it's only speculation, of course, but it is interesting. I mean, why parrots suddenly disappear out of, out of a cloak, closed cage and yet the owner's dogs remain? 
I just don't know idea where these people have gone. Um, and clearly, something must have happened quite suddenly because, like I say, the, there is, the Coast Guard have reported that when they went on board, they looked like there was no panic, they hadn't been caught in a storm, glasses with water up to the top were still filled on the table, uh, dinner was set, uh, half-eaten food. Whatever happened, something came abruptly and these people were never seen again. Between 1950 and 1954, nine freight ships carrying functional radio transmitters allegedly went missing in the Pacific. The exact number, location and type of ship depends on who you ask. The weather was calm and there were no documented hazards. But only one of the ships was known to have made a distress call. According to the legend, the lack of bodies or wreckage caused the Japanese government to fear that stretch of the ocean and assume something was amiss. They sent out a team of scientists to investigate, but that ship, the Kayo Maru, met a troubling fate of its own. Larry Kusha concludes in his book that based on correspondence from Japanese science and naval researchers, this well-built and well-equipped ship was demolished by a volcano or tidal wave. Volcanic activity under the sea wasn't unheard of, but this was something new. Many writers have said that they referred to it as Mano Yumi, or Sea of the Devil. Before Kusha's work, prominent linguist Charles Berlitz wrote several books about this subject, in which he offered extensive but implausible speculations, pointing to non-earthly phenomena. Despite Kusha's debunking efforts, Berlitz's sensational theories were hugely popular, and his work has sold millions of copies worldwide. His name remains synonymous with conversations surrounding the mystery of the Devil's Sea. According to Kusha's book, information about the Devil's Sea originally came from four news clippings from the New York Times. The report from September 30, 1952, indicates that a 60-ton ship named Toshimaru disappeared in the same stretch of sea as the Kayumaru. A second Japanese vessel may have been swallowed up by the volcanic explosions tidal waves last week, Mayawin Reef, 200 miles south of here, maritime authorities said today, the article states. Equally mysterious, there were no reports about the Toshimaru or the Devil Sea itself for 20 years after that. There are theories that there's these electro-gravitational anomalies that are taking place on both sides of the planet, be it the Bermuda Triangle is, is exactly on one side of the Earth and opposite is the Dragon's Triangle. And of course, could be some type of strange physics taking place between them. Just as there are anomalies at the South Pole and an alleged anomalies at the North Pole uh, and, and disappearances as well. So is there some types of physics taking place here? Earthly physics, natural phenomena that we're just unaware of that is causing these mysterious disappearances to happen. We don't know. Maybe as time progresses, Earth will give up some more of its secrets uh, or, or we advance further in physics and realise that there are doorways to other realities which people are seemingly disappearing through time and time again. Real volcanic activity encouraged talk of dragons. If this is the first time you've heard of an underwater volcano, you're not alone. They exist. According to Scientific American, they lie along 37,000 miles of ocean ridges and spew lava, carbon dioxide and other elements into the ocean. Because of their erratic behavior, they require regular monitoring by marine geophysicists. In Larry Kusa's 1973 correspondence with Shigeru Kimara, Associate Editor of the Ashai Shimbom, one of Japan's largest newspapers, Kimura notes that the Mayajin Sho volcano, the one that enveloped the Kayomaru ship, becomes active intermittently. The existence of these volcanoes is often mentioned along with ancient folklore that describes mythical creatures lurking under the sea, transforming calm waters into intolerably rough ones and sucking unassuming ships down into their lair. Apologies for any nightmares this might stir up. Dragons are particularly common in Japanese mythology, and just like we have superheroes with extraordinary abilities in today's movies and comic books, the dragons were thought to have supernatural powers. As if the Devil's Sea isn't a frightening enough name, it's also referred to as the Dragon's Triangle. 
The triangle part comes from its shape and positioning opposite the Bermuda Triangle. It should also be noted that the Dragon's Triangle is not plotted officially on any global map. So the exact size and parameters of the triangle aren't really known. Though there are some scientific reasons provided, people still believe that there are some strange forces beyond science and laws of nature that are acting in this location, which is also known as the Devil's Sea. Others believe UFOs and USOs are, to, are basically to blame. Some have even suggested portals and doorways to other worlds. With all the speculations, Dragon's Triangle still remains one of the world's most interesting mysteries of all. One that is unlikely to give up its secret anytime soon. A radio signal, but no relief. In Yomiuri Shibum, a Japanese newspaper article that Kusha cites from January the 14th, 1955, a 144-ton survey ship called the Shiyu Maru was reported missing in the same ideal weather conditions as the previous disappearances. This ship was supposedly well-equipped and carried a fairly large crew, so its unknown status was troubling. The article mentions a possible explanation for the frequency of ship disappearances, a rumor that it may be some kind of unknown power connected to the atomic age. Are they suggesting some kind of nuclear interference? Of course, such an outlandish theory has never been backed up. Preston Dennett's new book, Undersea UFO Base, presents 10 years of research into UFO and UFO activity off the Southern California coast. Preston delivers a fascinating book covering many incidents where UFOs have been seen entering and leaving the Pacific Ocean, as well as a strange underwater craft scene. For over 100 years, strange activity has been occurring off the southern coast of California, even to current times. Mile for mile, this area is one of the most top producers of unidentified flying objects and unidentified submerged object reports. Drawing on the first-hand testimonies from the Navy, Air Force, Coast Guard, police officers, lifeguards and residents, researchers have presented compelling cases for possible existence of an undersea UFO base. Sightings of weird lights, anomalous glowing clouds, strange objects flying in and out of the ocean. Mass UFO sightings and encounters with unusual beings have also been consistently reported over the last 60 years. The location has become known as a hotbed of activity and the reports keep flooding in. Mile for mile, this body of water is one of the biggest producers of USOs, unidentified submerged objects, on the entire planet. It lies between Santa Catalina and the mainland and reaches depths of nearly 5,000 feet. Dennett documented about 150 cases of UFOs and USOs here, reaching back nearly 100 years and still happening today. Boaters who choose to travel in this area do so at their own risk. There are nearly a dozen cases on record here in which boaters have found themselves targeted by USOs. If you do a study regarding coastal UFO phenomena, it's quite, the, the, alarmingly, they're the high results. There's a lot of UFO incidents, especially those which are very well documented in cases, which seem to be associated to UFOs that come from the sea. If we look at the 1977 and 1978 Calaris UFO incident, which was of a, a small island off the shores of Brazil, these objects were seen were, over a period of a few months coming from the sea. They always came out of the water and came from the direction of the sea. And, uh, and they actually, uh, they attack people. This is what happened in, in the Calaris UFO incident. It's not the only time as well, it also happened in India. And again, that was also in a location not too far from the sea. We have to ask, is that because they have a connection to the, to the sea, to our oceans? I mean, we do know that this phenomenon is hypervasive at the end of the day. So isn't it possible that they could be utilizing our seas and oceans to hide themselves until they get close to the locations where they want to be, just being kept out of sight. Very possible. They have demonstrated being hypervasive on many, many occasions. But when looking over all figures, UFOs have a very strong connection to the oceans, seas, and lakes of our planet. Consider what happened to the Washington family on July the 10th, 1955. 
At around 2.30 p.m., Mr. and Mrs. Washington and their 11-year-old daughter were 13 miles off the coast of Newport Beach on their way to Catalina Island on their yacht. When Mrs. Washington spotted the strange object hovering at about 2,500 feet, Mr. Washington stopped the boat so they could better observe the object. Using binoculars, they saw a perfectly round grey-white craft. It appeared to be rotating and was surrounded by a strange haze. After about six minutes of observation, the Washingtons restarted their boat and continued their journey. To their amazement, the object maintained its position directly over the boat. Mr. Washington radioed the Coast Guard and explained their situation. The officials at the Coast Guard told Washington to keep the object in sight and they would launch a plane to investigate. Suddenly, the object rose upward in a zigzag maneuver and disappeared into the clouds. By the time the Coast Guard plane arrived, the object was long gone. Unidentified submerged objects, or USOs, really could be no different than UFOs. Unidentified flying objects is just simply these things seem to be tra have the capability to traverse not only in space, but through our air and probably underwater. This is what is referred to as transmedium travel. These references have been brought up by the ATIP program uh, on more than one occasion. Now, water really might not be any different than space, to be honest with you. It's just treated as a vacuum. But some of these objects have travelled quite fast. 70 knots or 80 miles an hour has been reported of some of these objects on radar travelling underwater, some of them considerably faster. A similar case occurred in July 1987 to a group of people sailing from Catalina to Palos Verdes. It was around 4 a.m. when they saw what they first thought was a plane coming along the normal flight pattern. But as it approached, several strange details became apparent, says the witness. I noticed no tail, no wings, and no lights. Then it hovered over my sailboat, making no noise, and went towards Catalina Island and out of sight. Proof that UFOs are targeting boaters occurred on January the 3rd, 2004. On that day, young Chiron was on the coast of Santa Monica during the afternoon when he observed a metallic disc-like object hovering a few thousand feet above the yacht. The object stayed stationary in the sky, so he quickly grabbed his camera and snapped a photograph. Because he knew the length of the yacht, he estimated the size of the UFO as being about 30 feet wide. After a few moments, the strange craft darted away. These three cases involve UFOs flying and hovering above boaters. However, in this area, there are even more cases in which boaters found themselves targeted by objects coming from beneath them, USOs. Just ask the crew of the Hattie D. On February the 5th, 1964, 11 survivors were rescued by the Coast Guard from their emergency life raft following the sinking of their yacht, the Hattie D, off the coast of Mendocino. The boat had set sail from Seattle, Washington, and was making its way down the coast of California when tragedy struck. Without any warning, the yacht either struck or was rammed by an unidentified metal object. The boat sank shortly after, without any evidence remaining of what had struck their boat. Crewman Carl Jansen elaborated on the event, saying, I don't care how deep it was, what hold us was steel and a long piece. There was no give to it at all. Whatever sunk the Hattie D remains unidentified. Just as UFO encounters date back considerable time, so do USO encounters. One of my favourites is the diary logs of the Contiki expedition in 1947, which was considered to be some type of large log raft crossing vast distances of the ocean to get to Polynesia, I believe. Um, these logs describe the sightings of uh, sometimes of faint illuminations down on the water, sometimes round, oval or even triangular, which would suddenly split into two. Uh, three of these strange lights were wandering round in slow circles underneath the craft, apparently, and had been described as at around about five fathoms in length. Pretty large. The crew would watch phosphorescent eyes drifting on the surface of the water on dark nights. 
The diary logs also describe a sighting of something like a big wheel coming up from the water and rotating in the air. Some of these sightings lasted up to four hours and occasionally the sea was seen to boil and bubble. A classic case of a UFO targeting a boater occurred sometime in the 1980s. An anonymous gentleman, a senior electronics engineer, sailing on a foggy day between Santa Barbara Island and Santa Cruz Island, observed a fluorescent green-colored light ahead of him in the mist. Thinking it was another ship using bright lights to navigate the fog, he stopped and waited for it to pass. As it approached, however, he was still unable to distinguish any detail. When it was a quarter of a mile away and heading directly towards him, the witness discovered why. Says the witness, I finally realized that this dumb thing was underwater. I'm guessing it was, I don't know, maybe 300 feet in diameter, but I couldn't get any vertical dimension on it because it was under me in the water. It literally passed directly underneath me. The witness was sailing a fully equipped 38-foot sailboat. As the object passed beneath him, he took several readings from the depth sounder, determining that the object was about 100 feet deep. At this point, both depth sounders quit functioning. The witness checked his compasses. As he says, all three of them were slowly rotating and I wasn't. I tried calling the Coast Guard and the radio was dead. The object moved away and disappeared, leaving the witness badly frightened. A later check on his equipment revealed that all the compass mountings were broken. Says the witness of the incident, it was weird. I was just too goddamn petrified to move. It happens in case after case. When witnesses see a USO, they realize it is directly beneath their boat. In July of 1988, a man was making a night crossing to Catalina Island. He was aiming for two harbors, but when he reached the island, he realized he had gone too far east. He turned west and traveled along the Catalina coast towards two harbors. Says the witness, all of a sudden, the ocean lit up like a built-in pool about a hundred yards on both sides of me. Now, I'm a night scuba diver and know how light goes underwater. This was different. The light was in a perfect square. Besides the ocean lighting up right under my boat, the sighting seemed to be very brief. It lasted only about 15 seconds, but when I reached two harbors, it seemed like I'd lost two hours. It was very late. I never thought much about the time then. The witness says he never saw any actual object, just white light in the shape of a square. At the time, he had never heard of USOs. It wasn't until he heard other similar reports, he realized he had seen one himself. While the Santa Catalina Channel is extremely active with USO reports, Dennett also received reports of USOs from across the world, most of which involved boaters who found themselves of extreme interest to USOs. One such case comes from a gentleman called Dean Sanders. Says Dean, in August of 1984, after completing a month-long cruise in the Abacos Islands of the Bahamas, we were on our 30-foot sailboat sailing from Walker Key, Bahamas, to Jacksonville, Florida. We were about 90 miles off Daytona, Florida. We were on a course of 310 degrees at about three knots. At about 1 a.m., I noticed a green-colored beam of light sweeping the water under the boat from right to left. This was followed by another and another sweep of light under the water at regular intervals. This went on for a while and the beams kept sweeping under the boat. As the time went on, the beams grew stronger and more well-defined. About 15 minutes after we first noticed the light beams in the water, a large green object passed directly under our boat of about 300 degrees. The object was round, about 100 to 150 feet in diameter, and had spokes of green light radiating from it, rotating counterclockwise and bright lights around the mid-diameter. After the object passed under the boat, we saw the beams of light now sweeping from left to right for at least 20 minutes before we could no longer make them out. There is no way I can tell you what we saw, but it was real. I have seen submarines and I can tell you this was not a sub. 
Dean said that it was as if the object had aimed for his boat, heading right underneath it. It came in at a slight angle, traveling about 15 knots, three times their own speed. By the laws of chance, says Dean, for it to go directly under my boat is pretty thin. I feel like it came by to take a look. Another gentleman who contacted Dennett after hearing about his research was very reluctant to share his story, but finally felt compelled to do so, only on the condition of complete anonymity. I am loath to contact you, he writes, but I've been waiting for more information on USOs, and you seem to fill the gap a bit. There is not a lot out there. Rich Baker is a certified research diver, Nitrox certified with basic scuba and advanced open water. He is also a licensed US Coast Guard captain. In 2004, Baker and two other men were on a decommissioned 65-foot Navy boat equipped with military-grade sonar equipment, though the sonar was no longer functional. The boat had formerly been used by the Navy for submarine warfare testing. The men had just survived a terrible storm during which they very nearly lost the boat and possibly their lives. Immediately following the storm, they were coming into the Dominican Republic Haiti area. It was nighttime and they were heading close to the shore to find shelter. Baker was on watch. Suddenly, his eye was drawn towards a small luminescent ring under the water, approaching his boat. It glowed bright-eyed green and was moving directly toward him. Suddenly, there was another one and then another. The other witnesses rushed to look as more rings of light appeared. Baker saw now that they were larger than he thought. Some were closer and brighter, others were deeper and appeared smaller and dimmer. Some were only 10 feet deep, others appeared to be as deep as 100 feet. There may have been more, but were not visible in the deeper waters. They approached directly beneath the boat and pulsed on and off in seemingly random patterns. Baker and the other men were shocked. They wondered what kind of strange sea creatures these could be. They didn't appear to be jellyfish. On the contrary, they appeared to be artificial. All the doughnuts of light seemed to be identical, though at different depths. It was hard to tell if they were moving or were just blinking on and off. They were only visible near the vessel. As they moved towards the bay, it was like being in a minefield as the strange objects flashed on and off. Most alarming was the way the objects seemed to target only their boat and the area around it. As they moved into anchor, the objects continued to light up around them. Baker had the distinct feeling that the objects were aware of them, since they followed us and surrounded us. We've now examined eight cases in which boaters have been targeted by UFOs and USOs. All of these cases follow the same exact pattern. For some reason, UFOs and USOs are very attracted to boats. While at sea, boaters have to be aware of many things, wind and waves, regulations and safety, of other boaters, not to mention the wildlife. There is now one more thing to add to the list, USOs. When studying the subject of underwater UFOs or USOs, as they're all better commonly known, there are literally thousands all over the world in many reported incidents. Documented reports from police officers, um, naval personnel, fishermen, the military, the Coast Guard, and of course, ocean commuters. However, old documents found in Ireland's public records also describe strange, uh, strange incidents that date back to the 1800s. One such report reads, one evening long ago in harvest time, a strange thing was seen coming, flying through the air. It was like a train and was loaded with white people. When this strange train came to the lake, it dropped all at once onto the lake and was sending steam up into the air. After a while, it dropped into the fort and was never seen again. Now, another thing to point out here. The first thing is that the object was described as looking like a train, possibly cylindrical shaped with the bank of windows. Things like that have been reported many times. Number two, it was a strange statement to say the craft was full of white people. During the mid-1800s, there were very little black people in Ireland, so why did the witness emphasize on the word 
white people. Who or what were these white figures he was seeing? Number three, the craft made a controlled landing into the fort, which was an old name for a lake. Steam came off the craft as if it was in contact with the water and it was very hot. And then it quickly sank beneath the water, never to be seen again. Just as documented incidents of ghost rockets over Sweden in 1946, similar craft were seen and photographed descending into lakes. Steam was also seen and heard coming from these craft as they touched the water. Military officers occasionally attended these scenes. They were called out and they carried out investigations, sending divers into the water and even dredging the, the, the whole lakes, which actually revealed nothing. Wherever this craft was, landed on the water and sank beneath, must have traveled off in different locations away from that area. More modern day sightings still occur on an alarming scale of this very same nature. Things descending onto lakes and water, disappearing underneath and never to be seen again. Thank <laughs> you.